We live in a closely interconnected world. Local governments, civil society organizations, firms, and each of us as individuals typically interact on a daily basis with a number of different persons. We readily notice that each one differs from the other. Some are male and some are female. Some are older and some are younger. Some are outgoing and easy to talk with, while others are shy and challenging to establish rapport with. Their values differ as well, both as individuals and as role players representing the interests of institutions, firms, or other groups. Some people are very aware of the ethical dimensions of their lives and their work, while others barely seem to think of it. Clearly not all people operate at the same level of moral awareness or moral development. How good are we at discerning where people are at morally? Can we tell, or do we even try to tell, and what stage of moral development a person is situated at when we interact with that person? Should it matter? Imagine for a moment that you are a native English speaker traveling abroad in a country where very few people speak English. Your assignment in that country involves communicating effectively with the local people. So you try to find ones who at least speak some English. When you find these people, you first and probably most critically assess how well does this person understand me? Similarly, does this person's limited command of the English language make it very difficult for me to understand him? We must make a judgment. How competent is this person to communicate effectively in English? Based on that assessment, we may choose to use very simple words and avoid complex descriptions. Alternatively, we may discover that another local person has a comprehensive command of the English language and is an articulate speaker. We can talk with her freely using any words that we choose, knowing that she can respond even to complex questions. It may be best to interact with her instead. Sometimes, however, we don't have the choice and we need to interact with people at different levels of English competence. Ethics is also a kind of a language, a language of moral values. As with the recent example I just gave you, where language competence varied with the individual, the moral competence of individuals also differs from person to person. For example, experts argue that most children under the age of 11 don't yet have the intellectual abilities to be truly moral persons. We cannot expect these younger people to be able to empathize with others or to grasp the full moral dimensions of any given situation. If we were to communicate with them, we would not try to involve them in such ways. We would simplify our message to fit their abilities and understanding. This same type of evaluation is needed when we interact with other adults too, not all of whom think in the same moral terms with the same moral awareness or the same moral competence. Ethics guides us as individual decision makers. Ethics also can guide us when we work together in organizations, firms, or governments. An institutional culture exists any time people work together in close, organized networks over long periods of time. And this institutional culture has within it many moral values. Under good leadership, these moral values can be recognized and used to build a moral framework of related values that all within the organizations can be guided by. In other words, ethics. Ethics is just a system of related and complementary moral values that offers us critical insights in our daily decision making as individuals or as networks of individuals within any organization. In some organizations, an ethical culture arises unconsciously and without benefit of leadership. But often such a culture is filled with moral ambiguities and unresolved conflicts. Other organizations have leaders who appreciate that moral and ethical thinking ought not to be left to chance. These organizations have an intentional ethical culture that provides enormous benefits in guiding all within that network to honor and respect the shared moral values in all that they think and do. These organizations provide a regular and much used space for moral dialogue. By space, I simply mean a routine opportunity for staff to identify and strengthen their moral and ethical resources, and ample chances to discuss moral dilemmas and how to resolve them. This ethics-conscious approach is the best way to nurture a vibrant ethical culture, demonstrating comprehensive moral competence. Moral competence matters a great deal when it comes to the work of governance, where we often have to persuade, motivate, 
challenge, or lead. Each of these actions requires us to communicate morally in an effective way so that the results we seek can be achieved. We need to know how to frame the message to fit the moral sensibilities of the other person. Moral competence is an area receiving a great deal of attention recently, as with the introduction of the Moral Competency Inventory, or MCI, approach. This concept was introduced with an eye towards improving the effectiveness of the private sector in a book called Moral Intelligence Enhancing Business Performance and Leadership Success, written by Doug Lenick and Fred Keel. But the concept applies to the public sector and civil society equally well. The Moral Competency Inventory, the MCI, is but one of several tools that have been developed to evaluate how well decision makers in business and government perform when compared to the explicit ethical standards that are supposed to guide their performance. This, of course, assumes that we have made the connection between performance, meaning effective and efficient public service in the case of local governments, and ethics. A number of situations come up at this point. Often, the connection between performance and ethics is simply assumed. It isn't even discussed, and there isn't any code of ethics to offer guidance. Or, perhaps there is a code, but it is old and has gathered dust on a shelf for a long time. No one actually ever uses it. In that situation, we need to make the initial argument for raising ethical awareness, perhaps help by creating a new code of ethics or updating the old one. If this situation applies, it is important from the outset to get people to understand that ethical performance is a way of thinking, a moral language to be mastered, and not just a set of rules and prohibitions to obey. Okay, let's consider another situation. Sometimes an organization or government has a well-developed code of ethics, and perhaps even offers training of staff in this code of ethics on a regular basis. No one in this organization can tell you, however, where these ethical standards have come from and how relevant they are. Whose ethics are these? And what moral values are they based on? If no one can answer that important question, then it is time to revisit the ownership of an ethics culture in that organization or government. Awareness must be raised among all the staff, top to bottom, about the role and importance of morality and ethics. To achieve this, either a new, new code of ethics ought to be created, or the existing code reviewed so that the people concerned can get to a place of owning this code, feeling some loyalty to and identity with it. Only then will they begin to use it as a regular aid in their decision making. Here's yet another situation to think about. Perhaps decision makers are clear in their own moral thinking and are comfortable with the code of ethics that they have. Unfortunately, they are not effective in communicating in this moral language to those who must understand them and their motivations when they try to make a point that is based on ethics. They need to take action to get all stakeholders, for example, all of their own staff, to become comfortable with the important ethical standards that apply to the work that they do and the services that they provide. Everyone in the organization or the government needs to see that understanding morality and ethics is fundamental to the quality and effectiveness of their work. Everyone needs to cultivate their abilities to think morally, to see and navigate their way around moral dilemmas, and to solve moral and ethical concerns when they arise. This ability, this moral competence, can be compared to the ability to speak any language. It takes practice, practice and dedication to master it well. But it really isn't optional if communication is your goal. Moral competence is frequently defined as the ability to apply universal ethical standards to evaluate a situation or another person's character or both. Moral competence also means self-assessment, being able to use moral criteria to evaluate the quality and effectiveness of your own character, your own situation, and your own interactions with others in a variety of situations, work, social, cultural, political, and so forth. Moral competence therefore empowers us to pursue the best course of action and opens the door to integrity. Before we go any further, it's appropriate to stop and consider something rather important. Are people basically good or are they bad? What exactly is your view of the moral nature of humanity? There's many people that believe that all people will essentially be greedy and selfish unless we as a society use rules, laws, and social conventions to constrain them. 
Others take a more generous view, that people naturally have a strong inclination to care for and help their family, friends, and other persons, even when it means sacrificing something of their own immediate self-interest. The discipline of economics aligns more with the first view, that everyone is by their nature greedy. There isn't any moral judgment here, this is just the way people are, and we are best advised to find strategies that respond to this fact. People will want to maximize their own self-interest. Economics therefore uses incentives and disincentives to encourage such persons to behave in more socially acceptable ways, even if this means occasionally to accept some sacrifices. But unlike classical economics, or most approaches based on this rather negative view of the world, the MCI approach to strengthening moral competence is distinctive in that it assumes the positive, believing that most people not only have it within themselves to act with integrity, responsibility, compassion, and forgiveness, they actually want to behave this way because that's who they are. That's the fact of their humanity. The MCI approach looks for structured ways to strengthen and support people's natural inclination to do the right thing for the right reason, even if not always personally advantageous. That doesn't mean the MCI approach is impractical, it's very practical. It asks us to imagine a moral compass that helps us make morally acceptable choices. The moral compass links into our innermost beliefs and values, and uses these to guide our thoughts and actions. In other words, the moral compass makes our moral resources, resources that each of us has, accessible. This moral compass concept can be helpful in determining which areas in each of us are most in need of strengthening, so that we are better aligned with our own moral sensibilities and values. This is a process both of looking inside to identify our own moral resources and moral motivations, as well as evaluating the morality of our outer actions and their consequences. Who we are matters as much as what we do. Our ethical character is important. There is a very strong relationship between character, ethical leadership, and moral competence. The MCI helps us to evaluate moral character and moral competence. It sets out a 10-point framework that we can use to measure character and competence, asking, do we, one, act consistently with principles, values, and beliefs? Two, tell the truth. Three, stand up for what is right. Four, keep promises. Five, take responsibility for personal choices. Six, admit mistakes and failures. Seven, embrace responsibility for serving others. Eight, actively care about others. Nine, let go of one's own mistakes. And ten, let go of others' mistakes. While the MCI approach may be the best established framework to measure moral competence and guide us in how to strengthen our abilities to, per to perform to a high ethical standard, it isn't the only one. There are also several other approaches that are being used in the measurement of integrity. Well, to be more accurate, these other approaches all assume the first or negative model of human morality, and they are therefore measuring failures of integrity. This has one problem. When we only demonstrate how badly people fail, and don't take any account of their desire and ability consistently to perform with integrity, we soon come to a point where we believe that simply people cannot or will not pursue integrity. Perhaps it's true. Perhaps some people don't have it within themselves to care about others and to behave with integrity. If we expect such people to behave morally, we are setting ourselves up to be disappointed. Are we assuming that others speak the same moral language that we use when in fact they don't understand us at all? In other words, how can we evaluate the moral competence of the people we interact with? A famous American psychologist named Lawrence Kohlberg